The universe has always fascinated people when they contemplate the sky. Scientists and philosophers alike have pondered life's deepest questions. What would it be like to travel to distant galaxies and, more importantly, what life might exist there? Space is vast and its size is inconceivable. Even if we could travel at the maximum speed allowed by the universe, it would take us years to reach the nearest star. Fortunately, we have science fiction, like Star Trek, to tap into the human imagination, although we haven't yet found definitive answers to these questions. However, thanks to NASA's detection alert system, the final frontier may be within reach. Could we create something capable of traveling at the speed of light? Is warp drive just a ridiculous science fiction invention or is it something really conceivable? Let's find out. Nothing can move faster than light, which is the fastest object we know of. Light takes just over a second to reach the moon from Earth, traveling at a speed of 300,000 kilometers per second. In the blink of an eye, light can travel the distance between Los Angeles and New York. The closest star to Earth, Proxima Centauri, is at a distance of 4.25 light years. The Parker Solar Probe, currently in orbit, is the fastest spacecraft ever created, reaching a top speed of 450,000 meters per hour. At that speed, it would be possible to travel the distance between Los Angeles and New York in just 20 seconds, but it would take the solar probe about 6,633 years to reach the closest solar system to Earth. Why can't we just use conventional rockets? If we consider that the space shuttle reaches Earth orbit from a distance of just a few hundred kilometers above the surface of the planet, compared with the distance of 10 kilometers to Alpha Centauri, that same scale would be equivalent to the width of a hair if the Earth was reduced to the size of a grain of sand. Although we created spaceships, the space shuttles were not suitable for interstellar travel. Currently, five Earth spacecraft are leaving the solar system and traveling through interstellar space, like the New Horizons spacecraft. The Pioneer, Voyager, and New Horizons spacecraft are included in this discussion. However, compared to the speed required to travel between stars, they are all moving incredibly slowly. Let's consider the two Voyager spacecraft launched in 1977, Voyager 1 and Voyager 2. While neither probe is headed for Alpha Centauri, if one were, it would take tens of thousands of years to get there at its current speed. Eventually, Voyagers will pass by other stars. In about 40,000 years, the distance between Voyager 1 and the star AC79388, in the constellation Camella Partalis, will be 1.6 light years. Voyager 2 will pass 4.3 light years away from the star Sirius, the brightest star in the sky, in about 296,000 years. That's the distance between Alpha Centauri and Earth, about 4.3 light years. What about the New Horizons probe, the first probe to travel to Pluto and its moons? New Horizons speed is 58,536 kilometers per hour. It was launched from Earth in mid-January 2006 and took nine and a half years to reach Pluto. It would take about 78,000 years for New Horizons to reach the Alpha Centauri system if it were pointed in that direction, which it is not. As a result, conventional rockets are inefficient as they are simply too slow. People will need to travel faster than light if humanity hopes to travel conveniently between the stars. However, faster than light travel is still just a possibility in science fiction. Wormholes allow some characters, like the astronauts in the movies Interstellar and Thor, to instantly travel between solar systems. Another strategy is warp technology, well known to Star Trek fans. Several questions presented themselves to the Star Trek writers as they planned the series. In essence, they were producing a space opera, a type of science fiction set in space spanning several galaxies and millions of light years. Another example of this space opera subgenre is the Star Wars movies. A series like Star Trek is not meant to be boring or conventional, as the word opera suggests. When viewers think of the series, they probably envision melodramatic stories involving aliens, space travel and intense laser battles. Gene Roddenberry, the creator of the series, and the other writers had to find a dramatic and timely way to transport the protagonists across the universe, while also aiming to follow the physics as closely as possible. The biggest challenge was that even if a spacecraft could move at the speed of light, it would still take hundreds or even thousands of years to get from one galaxy to another. For example, it would take about 25,000 years to travel at the speed of light from the center of our galaxy to Earth. Of course, watching something like that wouldn't be interesting. The problem was solved when the warp drive concept was developed, allowing the Enterprise to travel much faster than the speed of light. But what was the justification? They needed a way to explain how something could move faster than the speed of light, which Einstein's special theory of relativity ruled out. The initial challenge faced by the writers was easier to overcome than one might imagine. The oldest gimmick in the physics textbook is Newton's third law of motion, which is also one of the most crucial concepts you need to understand before understanding warp drive. 
This law, which you've no doubt heard of, states that for every action there is an equal and opposite reaction. This simply means that there are two forces acting on every object as a result of every interaction between them. For example, two billiard balls at rest will exert an equal amount of force on each other if you roll one directly into the other. The set ball will propel the moving ball when it hits it, but it will also push the moving ball back. Every time you speed up in a car or fly in an airplane, you can feel this rule in action. You feel pressure in the seat as the car accelerates and moves forward, while the seat is pushing against you, you are also pushing back against the seat. So what does this have to do with the Enterprise and Star Trek? A person would be crushed against their seat even if it were possible to accelerate to a speed that is approximately half the speed of light. Even though it is pushing back with equal and opposite force, its mass is simply too small compared to the spacecraft. This is similar to what happens when a bug smashes into your car's windshield. How then can the Enterprise travel faster than the speed of light without the people on board perishing? We can turn to Einstein and the relationship between space and time to get around Newton's third law of motion and the impossibility of matter moving faster than the speed of light. Together, time and space, which have three dimensions of up, down, left, right and forward, backward, form what is known as the space-time continuum. It is important to understand Einstein's theories about the space-time continuum and how they apply to the Enterprise's interstellar journey. Einstein makes the following two postulations in his special theory of relativity. For all observers moving or not, the speed of light is the same, about 300 million meters per second. The same physical rules must apply to everyone moving at a constant speed. By combining these two concepts, Einstein concluded that space and time are relative and that an object in motion perceives time more slowly than an object at rest. We travel at a fraction of the speed of light, which may sound crazy to us, so we don't see our clocks ticking slower when we're running or flying. In fact, scientists were able to demonstrate this phenomenon by launching atomic clocks on high-speed rockets. When the clocks returned to Earth, they were slightly behind local time. What does this mean for Captain Kirk and the rest of the crew? In fact, an object experiences time at a slower rate as it approaches the speed of light. If the Enterprise were moving close to the speed of light, it would take 25,000 Earth years to reach the center of the galaxy. However, for the crew, that voyage would probably only take 10 years. While this may be doable for the people on board, another problem arises. If the Federation needed to manage an interplanetary civilization, it would face difficulties if it took 50,000 years for a spacecraft to reach the center of the galaxy and back. To keep the passengers in sync with Federation time, the Enterprise must avoid the speed of light. However, it needs to travel faster than light to efficiently traverse the cosmos. Unfortunately, according to Einstein's special theory of relativity, nothing can travel faster than light. Therefore, if we only consider special relativity, space travel would be impossible. However, it is necessary to examine Einstein's general theory of relativity, which explains how gravity influences the structure of space and the passage of time. In this theory, we can use the analogy of a stretched sheet. If you place a bowling ball in the center of this sheet, it will deform under the pressure exerted by the ball. If you put a baseball on the same sheet, it will roll towards the bowling ball. Although space doesn't exactly behave like a two-dimensional sheet in this simplified example, this analogy can help explain how massive objects like the Sun can curve space and affect the orbits of surrounding planets. It is important to note that the high speeds of planets prevent them from colliding with the Sun. The key idea to achieving warp speed is having control over space. If the Enterprise crew could warp spacetime, they could enlarge the region behind the spacecraft and shrink the region in front of it. Thus, the spacecraft could move locally at modest speeds, while generating its own gravitational field. In this way, it would be possible to avoid the disadvantages of Newton's third law of motion and maintain synchronization between the clocks at the starting point and at the destination. It would be as if the ship was pulling its destination towards it, while pushing its starting point backwards, instead of actually moving at a specific speed. The crew of a starship is protected by a warp bubble that surrounds them as space and time are warped. Science fiction writers have several options, as the concepts of Einstein's general theory of relativity are complex and still subject to interpretation. While our current technology may not be able to warp space and time, a fictional society set in the future might be fully capable of creating a device with the proper imagination. In the Star Trek universe, the warp drive is used to achieve warp speed. The matter-antimatter reactions that power the warp drive are controlled by a substance called dilithium electroplasm. During this process, a form of substance with its own magnetic field is produced, interacting with the spacecraft's warp coils to generate highly energetic plasma. Typically, a warp cell, as described by Star Trek writers, contains the warp coils. A warp field or bubble is created around the Enterprise throughout the system, 
keeping the ship and its crew safe as space moves around them. In 1994, Mexican theoretical physicist Miguel Alcubierre mathematically demonstrated the concept of compressing spacetime ahead of the spacecraft while expanding it back within the confines of general relativity. This implies that by reducing the distance between two points, travel between them would be faster, even without exceeding the speed of light in the surrounding space. However, Alcubierre's approach to compressing spacetime has a drawback. It requires negative energy or negative mass. Alcubierre's warp drive would work by wrapping the spacecraft in a bubble of flat spacetime and bending spacetime around it to shorten distances. A ring with negative energy density or hypothetical negative mass would be required for the warp drive to work. A possible solution would be the use of negative energy, since the existence of negative mass has never been observed by physicists. For a warp drive to work, it would take a significant amount of mass to tip the particle-antiparticle equilibrium toward negative energy. For example, if an electron and an anti-electron were to appear near the warp drive, causing an imbalance, there would be a decrease in energy density. This negative energy would be used by Alcubierre's warp drive to create the spacetime bubble. However, it would take a considerable amount of matter for a warp drive to produce enough negative energy. According to Alcubierre, it would take the mass of the entire observable universe to power a warp drive with a 100-meter bubble. There are some recent publications that present methods that seem to bring warp drives closer to reality. Although current work on warp drives is still at a theoretical stage, it is possible that in the future human creativity will be able to overcome seemingly insurmountable obstacles. In his spare time, NASA engineer David Burns has been developing a solution to this problem. He claims to have created a blueprint for an engine that, without the use of fuel, could travel at up to 99% of the speed of light. Burns uses a thought experiment with a box containing a weight hanging from a string, two springs at each end of the box, and the weight moving back and forth to demonstrate his idea. If the box were placed in the vacuum of space, the weight would appear immobile, like a stabilized GIF. However, the box would shake as a whole. Normally, the box would shake while standing still. However, if the mass of the weight were to increase in one direction more than the other, this would generate a stronger force and a greater push in that direction. According to the principle of conservation of momentum, the momentum of a system does not change in response to external influences. Therefore, it may not be possible to obtain full thrust under these conditions. However, a loophole in the theory of special relativity offers hope. According to special relativity, things get heavier as they approach the speed of light. In theory, ions can move faster at one end of the circuit and slower at the other. By replacing weight with ions in the circuit, the helical motor, as Burns idea is called, accelerates the ions along a circuit to modest relativistic speeds before adjusting their speed to slightly change their mass. To generate propulsion, the engine alternately moves the ions in the direction of motion. It is noteworthy that the engine has no moving components other than ions, which move along a vacuum line while being confined by magnetic and electric fields. This idea presents several practical difficulties to overcome, although it seems impressive at first. The helical chamber would need to be quite large, specifically 200 meters long and 12 meters in diameter. To generate 1 newton of propulsion, it would be necessary to produce 165 megawatts of energy, equivalent to the power of a power plant, to accelerate a mass moving at 1 kilogram per second squared. So despite the huge energy input, the output is extremely small, making the process incredibly inefficient. It is important to mention that Burns' approach is still in its infancy and faces significant challenges. However, even if the future is unpredictable, human creativity and determination will allow us to continue to push the boundaries of spaceflight.